and then start. Hello, I am Dr. Harvey Abrams speaking to you from the Stonewall National Museum and Archives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Welcome to another presentation in our Archives Alive series. Currently, there are hundreds of national and local magazines and newspapers in print and online, which cover just about every conceivable topic of interest to LGBT people, from politics to entertainment and from fashion to travel. When I was a young boy, there were none. Today, I'll be talking about the first major gay publication, the one that got it all started, the one that given the times had the courage to suddenly pop up one day on newsstands, then go on to impact the lives of so many people. So let's take a step back in time and see what American life was like shortly after World War II. America was basking in the glow of victory and experiencing unprecedented prosperity. Our factories were churning out cars, TVs, clothing, and everything else it and the rest of the world wanted. And yet, at the same time, we were engaged in a tense Cold War with the Soviet Union, a country intent on overturning our democracy. So while we're enjoying the Ed Sullivan Show and I Love Lucy, we're living under the constant threat of nuclear bombs and Russian spies. For people who were homosexual, the 1950s were a dangerous time. In fact, the worst time to be queer, in the words of gay historian John D'Amelio, but for different reasons than for other Americans. It was dangerous because homosexuals were under constant threat, not from Russians, but from our own government, who portrayed us as secretive as perverts who would betray their country to protect themselves. President Eisenhower, with a, within a couple of months of his election, issued an executive order which banned homosexuals from working in the federal government in any capacity, both civilian and military. FBI agents consorted with local police to patrol parks, beaches, and the streets themselves to arrest anyone suspected of being homosexual, especially if they worked for the government. Homosexuals lived in constant fear of being found out and of losing not only their livelihoods, but the love and support of their family and friends. As one writer aptly put it, these people are frightened to death. And so it is remarkable within the setting of paranoid insanity that gay men and lesbians found each other and formed groups to socialize, to air out grievances, and in time to organize, trying to figure out how they could be, make a better life for themselves. The first of these organizations was the Mattachine Foundation, later called the Mattachine Society, which was founded in Los Angeles in 1950. Emblematic of the time, its members, which included both gay men and lesbians, met secretly in people's homes. They used aliases and would close the blinds, believing they could somehow avoid detection from uh, FBI agents who seemed to be everywhere in their quest to spy on homosexuals, especially the ones who met in secret. But over time, Small groups cropped up in other cities in California and elsewhere. And, and, and within a few years, women branched off to form their own groups, the Daughters of Belitis being the first and most influential. Early on, some gay men and lesbians were disenchanted with Mattachin, left to start their own organization, one that would publish the first magazine written by homosexuals for homosexuals and which would represent the concern and interests of millions of Americans who had no voice, were silenced by fear, and who felt isolated, alone, and scared. It would link homosexuals in all parts of the world into a community of one. And thus they called their organization One, and their magazine by the same name, One. Prior to one, the magazine, the only news about anything homosexual came from mainstream news outlets, which cast homosexuals in a negative light, implicating them, for example, in sensational news stories uh, in the rash of sex murders and child kidnappings, which occurred during the late 1930s and early 1940s. Positive, positive articles about homosexuals were not just non-existent. 
they were in fact censored. With the very first edition of one, all that changed. The date was January, 1953. From the beginning, it was sold openly on newsstands and in bars and clubs, first in Los Angeles and then in New York City. Within a few months, it had over 2,000 subscribers. Its issues were being mailed to gays and lesbians and select heterosexuals in all corners of the United States. They, in turn, circulated those issues amongst their friends, creating an even wider readership. The magazine came out monthly and had beautiful design covers containing short stories and poems, movie and, and book reviews, and stories from around the world providing information to homosexuals about homosexuals. From its earliest issues, it contained articles on a variety of subjects, such as gays in the military, gay marriage, how to deal with blackmail, and how to avoid entrapment by police. It asked questions about gay mental health. Are homosexuals neurotic? And about the fabricated relationship between homosexuals and communism. Are homosexuals reds? They invited experts, gay and straight, to write for one, including the preeminent psychologist and friend to the gay community, Evelyn Hooker, who regularly wrote articles and book reviews. Donald Webster Corey, the brilliant sociologist and author of the landmark landmark book, The Homosexual in America, and best-selling author Norman Mailer, for example, wrote for one. Each issue brought hundreds of responses to its letters to the editor and op-ed columns. The same can be said of articles relating to psychiatry, religion, and the law, as one was not shy about encouraging debate, especially when it came to exposing mis uh, misinformation, ignorance, and prejudice. It also addressed personal issues on loneliness, dissatisfaction with bar life, on finding a partner, finding friendship, and on ways to integrate gay life with the life of families. For many readers, one became their lifeline, bringing them stories of others just like themselves, people who had similar concerns and interests. I ran numerous articles and stories with an uplifting message to gays everywhere. There is no reason to live in shame anymore. Gays and lesbians found their voice. And because homosexual empowerment threatened those intent on maintaining the status quo, the FBI monitored the ongoings at one very carefully. One day, the LA postmaster, alerted by an FBI informer, raided the offices of one and seized all copies of the August 1953 issue, refusing to mailing, mail them out, claiming they were obscene despite containing nothing remotely obscene. On its cover though, in bold letters, it dared pose a question, homosexual marriage? Just displaying the word homosexual was reason enough for the government to censor it. Eventually, one's attorney got the magazines freed from the grips of the postmaster, and that month's issue of one was mailed off to subscribers. But the issue of obscenity came up again the following year. FBI agents again stormed into one's offices in downtown LA and seized every copy of the October 1954 issue, again calling it obscene. That charge was based this time on a fictional love story between two women and the fact that it had the audacity by this time to have the words, the homosexual magazine emblazoned on its cover. This time, however, one's atone attorney could not get the magazine released, which forced one to now sue the LA postmaster in court. One lost its first round in district court and then again on appeal, leaving only one possible option left, the US Supreme Court. Keeping in mind that in 1954, every state in the United States still had sodomy laws, which made being a homosexual tantamount to being a criminal. And so I ask, would a homosexual magazine run by homosexuals risk shining a light on itself by taking its case to the U.S. Supreme Court? The answer was yes. After four long years following the magazine's seizure, one's obscenity case was finally heard by the Supreme Court and a decision handed down. The court's decision was unanimous. It ruled 
that the October issue of one magazine was not obscene and added to that decision the statement that homosexuality per se in and of itself did not constitute obscenity, not then, nor would it from that time forward. To say that this was a major victory for one, its editors, writers, subscribers, and all gays and lesbians, current and future, is an understatement. The leading court of the United States had spoken and validated the right of homosexual citizens to exist and be heard. I could stop here and feel confident that I've made a strong case for one's one magazine's place of honor in the annals of LGBT history, but that would leave one's historical arc incomplete. Unfortunately, though, following its momentous Supreme Court victory, ongoing internal power struggles between the principles of one came to a head in 1965, eventually causing it to split into two magazines, the original one and a completely independent new rival magazine called Tangents. Some staff stayed with one while others went to Tangents. And while both editors, uh, magazine editors, tried to breathe life into their magazines, sometimes with surprising success, neither magazine could survive very long with only one lung and they closed. Looking back, those magazines were trailblazers, especially one which had such a profound positive impact on so many people over its years of existence. Besides being the first, for its time it was also radical. Its overriding radical message was that homosexuals are worthy, worthy of dignity, worthy of respect. And because it had a long run, it was eminently successful in melding people who were isolated geographically, emotionally, ideologically, and spiritually into a community of one, just as its founders intended. And yet I like to think that maybe it was time for one to step aside and to give others a chance. Everything after all has a season. Homosexuals of the late 1960s had come a long way since the early 1950s when one began. They were stronger, more connected, more visible, more confident. Much of this, no doubt, was due to the visibility and voice that one promulgated. When the gay liberation movement exploded off the starting block at Stonewall, the community was primed and ready to go, ready for other, newer, more militant gay publications with their own rallying, rallying cries for community, dignity, and radical change. And so they appeared on the scene. But for today at least, and hopefully forever, let us remember that there was, for a time, just one that started it all. Before signing off, I'd like to mention that I had the great privilege of having the original issues of both One and Tangents magazine to use as primary, primary sources for my talk today. The complete series of both magazines are stored and preserved here at the Stonewall National Museum and Archives. So until next time, this is Dr. Harvey Abrams. Thanks so much for watching.